think that what we do a lot of times is we go straight to um, Google Images or we'll go to iStock Photography or even Getty Images and we just Google what is the most obvious metaphor or most obvious solution. And I would strongly encourage you, I know there's a heavy ratio of creative types in here, to step away from the computer, draw the central idea and then do some line maps and crazy maps because your competitor is going to go for the first piece of cliche artwork that they can find too. So you want to look smarter than your competitor and not just go for some obvious um, cheesy staged piece of photography. At least the color palette works as a system, so that's good. Oh my god. <laughs> One point per slide. Right? That's the thing about this medium that makes it amazing is that we should think one point per slide, one message, and what make that message really, really clear. Um, I, I did actually get a chance to read this bullet, and so I brought a little prop for you. Because um, it says, if you read it, the very first bullet, every software product has a target audience. For example, the audience for a video game software is completely different from banking software. So he had an opportunity for a diagram. So what you do with a diagram is you use shapes to communicate your ideas. So he has software, which is different than banking software. And you can use circular shapes or angular shapes to create contrast when two things are different. So you have two things that are very different. When you choose to make shapes, you can assemble them in a diagram. There's different ways to connect shapes. You either connect with a line, which just means they're in a relationship. See that? See my graph? Or you can connect them with an arrow, which means one thing flows to the other. You guys can see that. So he had an opportunity to create a diagram and chose to put it in prose instead. So whenever you describe something in relationship with something else, you can show that relationship by proximity. Oh, these things are related because they're close. Oh, these things are related because they overlap. These things are related because they're connected. Or these things are related because they flow. So there's different ways to show relationships when you're trying to assemble something. And he had a perfect opportunity to turn that text into a picture, which could have been a diagram using different kinds of connection devices. Do you like these props? <laughs> Good thing they had a printer in the speaker room this morning. How much did you spend on those props? <laughs> so you know, my issue with this is I don't think in PowerPoint or Keynote or whatever you use, I don't think there should be one complete sentence. I know you want subject and verb and you know period and punctuation. I, I, I think complete sentences, much less complete paragraphs, are just a total mistake. Um, you know, if you want to quote somebody, just take the best part where you know the guy says this is the best thing I've seen since iPad 2. Okay, fine. You know, I like that little bullet, but a complete sentence or a complete paragraph. The other problem I have with this is. This is kind of a duhism, and if you ever find yourself thinking when you see a slide, well, duh, that means that slide is not necessary. So yeah, I mean, every software product has a target audience. No shit. I mean, my so opinion, don't use a diagram. I mean, actually, that might not be that might not be a duhism. There could be software that doesn't have a target. Uh, but you know, the point here is that what are you trying to tell me? I mean, the. I can't remember what I said in the speech yesterday and today. That's, that's a different problem. But, um, when you make a presentation, did I use an airplane analogy when I talked about how to pitch? OK, so good. <laughs> so this will be a fresh one. So I think that this, this, this kind of beginning with that meaningless first picture and now this, um, if you were to use an aviation analogy, this is a 747 taking off at SFO. And it's going and two miles later, the thing's rattling and it's finally taking off. And you say, thank you, God, I survived another takeoff. Thank God Almighty. That's right. The, the analogy you should be thinking of is think of yourself on an aircraft carrier. You're on the USS Stennis or the Stennis or the USS Nimitz, and you're in an F-18. Plane costs $26 million. There's a catapult that's going to rocket you off, and in 1.2 seconds, you're going to be going 300 miles an hour. And if the afterburners don't kick in, you're going to fall off the side and die. Okay? <laughs> so you have 1.2 seconds to get vertical. That's what you should think of. Not 747, F-18. Because unlike the Navy, 
you know, they have helicopters flying around the carrier when people are taking off so that in case you don't take off, they can rescue you. There is no rescue in a PowerPoint presentation. If you, do, if you miss the takeoff, you die. And I'd say we're pretty comatose uh, right here. Yeah, we, I call it a glance media, similar to billboards. You know, when billboards first came out, all this regulation came out that they wanted to stop it, make them illegal because they were pollution. Uh, visual pollution, and they thought people would kill themselves when they rear-end each other from reading the billboards. So they put regulation about how many words could be on a billboard because they wanted everyone to be able to look at it, process it in about three seconds, and then focus back um, on the driving, right? And if the same thing kind of happens in a presentation. They should glance at your media. It should only be a mnemonic device for the audience to remember what they have to say. It should never be a teleprompter for you. It should never be a read-along for reading on our backs. It should be a mnemonic device. The only thing up there should be either something visual or verbal that the, that the audience can remember, process quickly, and focus back on your verbal stream. People cannot process an audio and a verbal stream. I mean, a, um, they cannot read and listen at the same time. They choose one or the other. So the more difficult you make your slide to process, the more complex it is, the longer it takes them, the less they're going to hear what you have to say because they're going to be um, visually processing, processing what's going on. Wait, let me, yeah, I'll just show from yesterday's... Um, and his AV tech support. Yeah, right. <laughs> I screwed up. So, by contrast, I like his <laughs> I didn't by like contrast, his this was my first slide. Yeah, so, arguably, I provide much less information. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, I mean, this is an F-18. I'm launching into it. You need to be like, well, I'm not telling you. According to a McKinsey study in 2010, they found 10% greater effectiveness in sales presentations when you are enchanting. You know, <laughs> and every presentation has a target market. Every enchanting person has a target audience. I'm like, if you don't know that, you don't belong in the presentation, basically. So, and I think the pressure's on you off. more. I mean, you guys are in an advertising space, so they're expecting you to be highly conceptual and write really amazing words um, and really conceptual words. So the pressure's on more uh, for you guys today. Oh, you need to. Switch. Can oh, you switch back? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> so, I, I mean, obviously, there's a ton, a ton, a ton of um, text in here, which means they're actually using a document. Now, interesting, he's an SAP consultant, and I happen to have a little SAP document, and I want to show you guys um, what you can do with a document. Um, he's using it as a document. Now, maybe the deliverable was a document. So he should PDF it, distribute it like a document. There's nothing that says that everybody has to move into InDesign to do page layout. You could use PowerPoint for your page layout too. Um, that's not a problem at all. But if you are choosing to use PowerPoint as a document, here's an example from SAP for our SAP consultant. You're going to go in to a company and they have a really good visual system for their documents. You should probably know that so that you represent yourself just at least as well as they do. So I love this, doc this uh, PowerPoint because they're using things that a document would use. They've got a title page. They've got an index. Like documents have indexes. PowerPoints usually don't. But they have a, a doc, an index. And then they have a cookie trail across the top. So as you navigate through it, you know where you're at. It's dense. It's got lots of content. It's beautifully laid out. It follows a grid. It follows everything that a document would normally follow. So if you create a document like this guy did, make it look like a document and always aspire to look at least as good as the pe company you represent or the people that you're going to talk to. But Nancy, would you use, would you recommend they use this to present? Never. Okay. So that's the difference is you've got to realize that at one point you're done making your document and then you have to go through a completely different creative process to take the findings and the meaning out of the document and put it into your story. Because documents rarely create a natural narrative art. Documents are usually topical, whereas um, presentations are normally narrative in nature and structure. So I'm just curious. I, mean, I think this is a beautiful document. So if you were really doing this, would you take that PowerPoint, save as, and start stripping stuff out? Um, you could do that that way if, if you wanted. Um, we actually propose that you completely start over because a lot of times the findings aren't happening in the same topical order. Mm -hmm. So you have to actually um, figure out what the real meaning is because to connect and enchant people, you have to have meaning and make personal connections. So you have to actually start over with a different creative process. So we create one template for documents and a different PowerPoint template for um, 
larger venues and real presentations, and they're two very polar opposite uses. So you don't use the same template, you don't use anything, you actually switch your creative process and use a completely different um, for, uh, formula. For that. So I don't know how much torture we have to put for KC through. <laughs> Um, we can just look through the rest of them. Um, here's a matrix. Um, um, one of the things that's interesting that um, about like this, the, the color choices that you made is um, if you're going to use color in a projection medium, it needs to contrast. And you can see that this doesn't contrast really well. So color and contrast is... Maybe that's why he made it all caps. Oh, could be. He was trying to create a creative form of emphasis. So... Well, even, you know, that... that that matrix there. See, my problem with something like this is, where should your eye go? I mean, your eye's got to go someplace, right? And, and knowing that it's got to go someplace, you got to give it some place to go. It, it needs to be like one obvious anchor. And do I read the labels across the top? Do I read the cost to fix a defect? Yeah. Do I read the requirement? You know, I don't know. I don't even know where to begin on that document. Um, which is a big problem. You need to, you need to like suck people's eyeballs right to one specific place. You want all the eyeballs in one place. You don't want people sitting here trying to interpret what the hell does this mean? Because yeah. uh, they try to create some sense of hierarchy through the color, I think, but it doesn't work because they've got kind of dark. Well, there's, yeah, there's four they colors should, there. Which yeah. color do I pay attention? I know they should have. Uh, they should have um, had the font uh, size vary also. Um, so that you can at least process or be drawn um, to one point. The other thing they didn't do is they didn't emphasize. Like they could have could have color coded a square. Like if the big aha here is that 15x was a system test, there should have been like some way to emphasize this. So to Guy's point, there's no clear eye flow and there's no emphasis, and they haven't used contrast appropriately to draw out the meaning of what was the most important thing on this chart because. What you guys are going to do is you're going to process the top, you're going to process the left, you're going to try to, we're puzzle solving creatures, you're going to try to solve the puzzle of why I'm showing you this, that'll take you about 25 seconds and then you're going to focus back on what I'm saying. So just tell them, this is huge right here, but it's still painted in the context of the other data, so it looks like data and it doesn't look like do, data. Do you think that you should ever use table format? This, I mean, this could be presented, obviously, in... A complex, bar graph, yeah, bar graph, a I complex don't know, matrix is definitely more document-like yeah. um, in nature. So you, if you really are talking about something and you should be fired up about 15x, you should just put like 15x, you know, big on a slide. Uh, so that's what they, Steve Jobs would have one slide that said 15x, right? Because right? I remember an iPhone intro he had and it said 76 million. I don't even know what it was, but yeah. <laughs> 76 million is a big number of whatever. Right. It could be 76 million batteries came back. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, your iPhone's dead. Yeah, right, that's a whole other story. So I, I, I never, ever use a matrix because I think like this.
So again, this is projection only or will they ever have to um, print it out because your deck from yesterday would take a long time to print and it also won't be able to travel without Guy's narrative. Um, so it's really important if you know that your deck That's needs to travel. To know <laughs> if you know it's going to travel <laughs> and you don't. <laughs> That's why they have to buy the book. <laughs> so... <laughs> There's a plan. There's a plan. I have a plan for everything I did. So, you know, here's, here's another good test. So, uh, six of you at the back wall, can you tell us what the last two words are at the bottom of the second column? <laughs> yeah. But my point is, this is not a big room. I mean, imagine, God forbid, you're... That is not So, you know, piggybacking on that story, which is a great story, 
Um, one thing you should be very cognizant of is when you show up to some of these, these events, the, the computer is someplace back there with you know, two nerdy guys in black shirts <laughs> Listening to you, listening to Pink Floyd while you're changing your slides and yeah, Dan. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're listening to Pink Floyd right now, aren't you? And, and you know, there's this there's this uh, little box in front of him, and every time he sees the green arrow, like Pavlov's dogs, he salivates and presses the button. And so, one very interesting consequence, if you go with the theory of 400 clicks. Pavlov's dog has to salivate 400 times on cue. That is a non-trivial task. So I don't do it if I have to. Yeah. So you need you need to either insist on controlling the computer yourself, or or you better have a whole lot less clicks than 400 because the odds of somebody listening to Pink Floyd getting 400 clicks on cue is zero. Um, so power tip for you is uh, I always travel with my own remote because I don't want ever for the people to say, oh, we don't have a remote, but you have to let us use ours and you know, look for the green light. Um, and another power tip for you I will give you is I travel with my own countryman E6, that's this. And uh, so Nancy's losing a lavalier, and I'm using this. This is much better sound, at least I think so. And I, I travel with it for two reasons. One is obviously the better sound. But secondly, and probably more important, um, whenever I show up to a speech and I say, okay, I'm using my own countryman, the guy listening to Pink Floyd is inevitably very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> There's not, how many speakers show up with their own countrymen? Not too many. Yeah. So, does it impress you when a speaker shows up with their own countrymen? See, so like he's, he's already thinking, this guy is into That's it, he understands, he appreciates my art. And you know, he appreciates my skill, so like he's really impressed. He knows that I'm not some total bozo who's So he's more forgiving when he comes in the game. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so so that's a power tip. Show up with your own remote controller and show up with your own countryman. And countryman countryman is the best, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think this costs about seven hundred dollars or something. It's about seven hundred dollars for this. Now you might say that's a lot of money. Um, but considering, I mean, if you're trying to raise five million bucks, you know, you're worried about a seven hundred dollar mouthpiece. I mean, if something's wrong with you, um, it would be like, you know, if you're Yo-Yo Ma, you don't say, well, what's the cheapest cello I can find? I mean, you know, it's, it's this is your instrument. This is what's going to make you or break you. So, countryman and your own remote. I have a specific remote I like. I like it in my hand. I like how it clicks. So. Yeah, I have a specific one too, which is the same one, and that one. What is that a launch? Because it's the female form, kind of. Too. Yeah. It fits in your you caress it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could also be a massage device. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm one of my better days. Yeah. It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when your husband's with not, not with you. Um, it also the, uh, it? <laughs> the USB thing for this uh, has one gigabyte of storage. So you can put your presentations on this. And I, I always carry it. I carry, I carry a loose thumb drive, I carry my presentation on this, and I carry my computer. And my presentations are also online. Yeah. So I have like, literally four things has to go wrong before I cannot get to my presentation. And I carry my own speaker set. So even if they have AV, probably one out of ten times I have to pull out my own speakers, which is weird. Your own speakers? Uh -huh. like I have these speaker little speakers? tiny, no, I have these little tiny ones that I put up here, and they can carry a room. I can carry a room about four times this size. Yeah. I've had to pull them out more times than I have to Wow. Share. What are those speakers? Hmm? What brand? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't even think to bring it today? This is a uh, Kensington. I didn't bring it today because we're not doing audio. Uh, audio <laughs> <laughs> but Bose makes some pretty good small models. Yeah. yeah. And the jam box. Jam box. Yeah. Well, what, you know, one day I, I weighed um, everything I have in my backpack, and it was like 30 pounds or something because I have... I have a MacBook Pro, an iPad, an iPhone, charger for all of them. In my suitcase, I have another charger, because if you ever lose your charger and you're in like Istanbul, you know, it's not like there's an Apple store every corner in Istanbul. So I have a second charger in my bag. Get internet access, and so sometimes I carry a Mac and if you see it just depends. See, 1020, 1020.
20, 30, right? You know, 20 minutes becomes... <laughs> or, or 40 minutes because you have to uh, <laughs> invest technology. <clears throat> um, this was interesting to me. This starts to be a diagram where I was telling you that you can take, you know, two pieces and connect them with something or you have things that are related. Um, um, so whether it's um, print or projected, um, the diagram doesn't have a natural flow. Um, so you've got um, two things that overlap, which usually means something. That's a classic diagram type, yet we haven't really defined what else is going on here on the right side. Um, and then there is, there is this, uh, my natural order to process it was this, 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 and then I noticed it kind of went up here, you know, because there's info here and here. So, so I had to, um, you're supposed to control the eye flow. Like people shouldn't be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, I get it. You know, it should be like sweep, you know, through scale, through um, sizing things larger, size smaller, through dark color, light color, contrast. Get them to be able to process um, the information really quickly. And my question on this slide would be, why is that C capitalized? Why is that C capitalized? Um, why is that C capitalized? Why is that T capitalized? Why, I mean, why is there some stuff that's capitalized as if it's a proper noun and some stuff that's not? Because, uh, you know, logically, if you're saying, oh, so the important stuff should be capitalized, then, you know, shouldn't the I and idea be capitalized? So, like, admittedly, I'm kind of a Chicago manual of style Nazi, so, I, you know, I really am into grammar. And, although and you know, I, as weird as that sounds, is that, like, I think we, like, on the Apple account in 1988, and what we had to do is we had to edit every slide to the Chicago Manual of Style. Really? So if you show, uh -huh, we had to use real M dashes. We had to we had to do the line spacing, the kerning. We had to do everything. We had to have the punctuation right. Um, we had to know how to do everything according to. We had to edit everything to the style. And, so and this is first Steve Jobs. So how did it come out? No, was driving it then, but that was the first worldwide developers conference that we did. So you got to know your customer is the point. If you're going after a medical co company, you should know all of the right medical dictionary, medical terms, use the acronyms correctly. And, or we would have gotten booted. I mean, it was actually we had this fat checklist of every single thing that had to be done to every single slide. And really? Were checked in for, yeah. Do you have the checklist? No, I mean, we still use it. We uh, still have a derivative of it because we're still doing the show. But. Any, like, Give it to me. I'd love to I see should, it. I should. That would be a great There's document. There's a whole lot of things in it about slide. I've been sued by Apple. Yeah. Well, it's a master one. We use for some clients, but the typography, we still do typography and we still edit to the Chicago Manual style for Apple. It has to have sweet, how could they not have sweet typeset slides? So. Uh, yeah. And, well, the irony is so Apple demanding adherence to the Chicago Manual style, and Steve has slides with two words on it, right? 76 million. That's 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 why Steve is Steve. Well, and then if you don't have to, I mean, it's just a, I mean, and there is definition around what is a bullet. Bullet should not have punctuation. Bullet, and that's all in the Chicago Manual style. Uh, this particular community is that you guys should be writers or have access to a really clever writer. And a lot of these um, titles, there's no like verb in it. So I personally think titles should have a verb. Every title should be emotionally charged in some way, so that if you just went across the slides and you're working with venture capitalists, if all they did is read your titles, your titles should tell a story and a narrative. Now, I don't think the bullets should be dense, and I think your sentence should be short, but you should have good access to good verbs and a good vocabulary, and, and how you frame up the title of every slide should show how smart and clever you are. So, so my slide that says likability should say achieve likability? Well, that's different. So what you're doing, that this is in um, when you have title and bullets or title and a diagram, yeah. if there's a title. What you're doing is highly conceptual single images, which is the better way to go. Yeah, so you don't have to have, okay. Okay. yeah, you are I'll emotionally fix it. charged. <laughs> you don't need any more emotionally charged verbs. Now, Nancy's firm, or, I don't know, maybe you did it for, for me yourself, but Nancy, uh, prior to the enchantment presentation, I had one called the, um, the art of innovation, and I, I sent through what I was using, <laughs> and you know, the out came up the other side. It was a very different presentation, including fonts. You created yeah, a font. We, for we me, created right? a font, and we yeah. hand drew sketches for him, um, and everything was kind of had a had a it felt tactile. I think I think what's happened, we're getting so tired of things being digital that it kind of feels like gosh, if I could just reach out and touch that or like 
lick it or something <laughs> like it. You know, did you want to like be closer to the graphics? Um, and, and we tried to do that um, for time. Of course, it takes us a long time because he always wants it for free when he calls us, and so I always have to try to squeeze it in. So. Yeah, but look at all the publicity I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would. I would get calls from people and be like, I just heard guys speak, and he said your name at the very end. I'm like, Woo! So here, switch. Uh, okay. Switch. Well, I'm So this is this is the slide that this is the after this is after it was Duarteized. Um, so the art of innovation, make meaning, this stuff. All this was done, and this is one of the few places I've ever had text. And this is because I am quoting a Nike commercial for uh, Nike women's aerobic shoes. And so, you know, but this is the nature of my slides. And then this is. The second time I really have a complete sentence, and the whole purpose of this is to show how ludicrous mission statements are. So I needed to have a lot of text, because you want to show that it's stupid to have well, a lot of text. Well, and you read text. it too, that's not Yeah, absolutely. Quiet. So if you have a lot of text, you should be quiet and let them read it, or read it together, like literally, let's read this one together, and then read it to them, but have it be really intentional that I'm turning my back and we're reading together. So the contrast is that's actually a really bright line. It doesn't show up well. <laughs> it's really good for me to see. Um, it was a combination of Illustrator and Photoshop. Um, most everything we do usually is in uh, PowerPoint. Um, we have things that you can, you can actually do very flash-like stuff in PowerPoint if you know what you're doing. You can have large things move around and pan and zoom. And, um, but this particular one, the assets were built in uh, in a combination of Illustrator and Photoshop. So. Myself, in when you're creating a critique, um, the things that are the most important are contrast. Contrast is important not only visually, but contrast is important in what you say. Like one of the things Guy and I are doing is we're creating contrast and keeping you interested by moving back and forth. So you can create contrast on the slide, contrast on the stage, contrast in your voice, and you can create um, contrast in your content. And that's by moving between what is and what could be. What is, what could be, and it creates a rhythm and a beat to your content too. So contrast is important in everything that has to do with the presentation. And that's the word, if you use any word when you're working with your artist stage, I, I, there's no em emphasis because they haven't, there is no contrast. Contrast creates emphasis. So, I don't know, you guys want us to keep going? Can I ask a question? Yeah, I'd love to take questions. You alluded to movement and, uh, you know, if you're proficient in PowerPoint, obviously there are tools to animate things, and there's a lot of cheesy batting footballs and cars screeching and stuff like that. But the, you mentioned the eye, the sucking guy bob, and that's what it's in place. One of the things that, that you just said about contrast brings to mind utilizing the ability to transition from an image to an image, from, from word to word, and concept to concept. And I, I didn't see that yet. I don't know if that's your dick, that, but that's been really, really Yeah, animation needs to be purposeful. You should only use animation if it adds meaning or you use it to reveal information over time. So you can do things like you can pan using a push transition. You can pan through a lot of stuff in PowerPoint so it looks like you're talking about the same concept in the same space. Um, so there's lots of ways to do it. The, um, we have, like, this isn't like a um, portfolio thing. The guy asked me if I could pull up stuff if it was relevant. But, um, a lot of the pieces, if you go to Duarte.com and you look at our work, 90% of the stuff up here was done in PowerPoint and put out to a movie. Um, so there is a lot of ways. You can see kind of a rough overview of how there's like big concepts, big pictures. Um, and, and if you want to get like kind of dig in and get inspired how you can use animation, you can go up here. There's another one you can de deconstruct. If you did a find on Duarte and five rules, on Google, there is a PowerPoint file up there where we use every transition.
transition, almost every transition in PowerPoint 2010 to create this story. Um, and then you can actually deconstruct it all. And it's really intense animation, but the animation is lovely. Like it's almost a, a Rube Goldberg machine as this ball goes through all these things. And we had to come up with a concept that used an enormous amount of animation because that's what Microsoft wanted us to do. Um, so we did it. So you can deconstruct it and make sure it all has uh, really beautiful motion. Um, by contrast, I literally never use transitions. Steve um, never uses transitions. Yeah, I, I've had friends who like, you know, they have it drop down from the side or the Venetian blind slats <laughs> open up and all that. And I, I just think that's just putting lipstick on a pig. I mean, if, if that's what's going to make your presentation There's interesting, you no suck. No reason to use lines, ever. Can I, can I give it a, a, a post? Sure. Not to where it's cheesy or like that kind of thing, but just to show the importance of what it's like. Yeah, you can use a transition for emphasis. What he was saying is, it's good to use. You could use lines or something stupid like that if you want. <laughs> but if you have a whole deck and you go to um, you click, 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 there's no transition. And all of a sudden, you do a transition. Okay. So that's using animation to create emphasis. And if you do happen to choose the mini blind transition, wow, <laughs> there's a lot of other ones out there. Um, or checkerboard, or boomerang. We have certain ones where first thing when we're training a new employee is see these transitions here. Pretend Microsoft did not think those up. <laughs> but then they're trained. <laughs> sketching at the same time the presenter is presenting because what Prezi is is this great big canvas, for those of you who don't know, it's this great big canvas and you can pan around it, you can zoom left and then you can zoom oh, in and then you is. zoom out and then you zoom to the right. School. And then you, yeah, 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 he loves this, he's interviewed him a bunch. And then you flip somersault and the next thing you know your, your audience is turning and then they're looking and it's twisting and turning. So I, you can do most of those things in PowerPoints of zooming in and zooming out. I feel like what it's done is it has two transitions that are more special than any other transition in PowerPoint, which is zooming in and panning. My concern is that it's not adding meaning. So the first time I've ever seen it used effectively was this year at TED. I mean, they just released his talk yesterday, Time is Perfect, his name's David Christensen. And he, what he, David Christian, excuse me, what he did is he used it to show the whole timeline of all of evolution. So he can zoom in and he can zoom out and you see the, the the whole and then you see its parts and then you see the whole and then you see its parts. That's very effective. I have had conversations with Prezi. I'm going to make my public stance about it. I've been like talking to them about what I'm going to say. But um, I have no idea why you would turn, why something would happen to turn. I get motion sick, so I have to actually close my eyes if I know they're using Prezi um, extensively. And then I just turn on my audio stream. So, um, but to the point of using it as a graphic recording tool, which they have a strategy for that. It's being used in education. What these kids are doing is they'll do visual note taking. When a group of people, and a group can log into Prezi, when a group of people collaboratively type notes together, the learning goes up incrementally. And so that's a fantastic use for Prezi, where the kids are going in, or anybody can go in, like this meeting, 12 of you could have been in a Prezi constructing notes from this talk. That's a powerful learning tool. I'm not excited about it as a projection tool, um, unless you show constraint. Uh, how do you, if the audience says, well, can I have a copy? Can you post it? What do you do? It's in the cloud. It's in the cloud and you send them a link. Yeah, but they get a link. what if they want hard copy? I mean, what if you don't, you can't print it. That's, it's a hard copy, it's too cinematic. It's too um, big. And does it, does it run by itself? Because when I look at it in the cloud, I don't know where I'm zooming. You're in control of the pace. Yeah, so what you, you do, the, yeah. you Joe Blow or you the presenter? The presenter predefines it. So what happens is I make this great big mural in the digital space. It could be as big as this wall. Uh -huh. And I might take you from that corner and fly you 100 miles an hour to this corner, that, that, that. But I get to control the path that through which you process this uh, larger piece I'm of too old for that. I know, me too. <laughs> Think about that. So if you're using Prezi, if they're too old for them and you're going for some money, <laughs> I had a modest tone in that. Your market is senile <laughs> people. Forget it. <laughs> Just think about it and use it uh, gracefully. Yeah. Question. I know uh, what's happening a lot now is a lot of people are doing screen shares and yeah. you know phone conversations. I was hoping you guys could talk towards that of you know what your feelings are of 
Meaning That's screen practices. share meaning is. Like you're, you're on the phone and you're doing a screen share and someone else is in another area. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that or some best practices. I'm doing one with uh, Chris Brogan on Monday. Okay. And I'm like whipping out the Yoda ears. I'm bringing puppets. I mean, I'm like, I don't have visuals. You know, so if you ask a question and I'm like, oh, let me show you a visual, I'm going to go to a visual. But I'm trying to make it like as entertaining as possible. Um, I, well, I, don't, I don't think I go to the extreme that you're mentioning, but whenever I do these, go to webinar, go to whatever things, I use the same presentation. I mean, like, it's identical to me. Um, because when you give a large keynote and there's, you know, the lights are in your eyes, you can't really see the audience anyway. So, you know, when I did one for Mark uh, Snover here, so uh, I, it's no difference to me. Um, you could make the case that you don't have as much eye contact, you don't hear your audience laughing and all that, so it's, it's you know, maybe 20% harder, but you know, at the end of the day, I mean, you're either a good presenter or not, and you just have to power through it. Yeah, you have, you have to use contrast. You, know, yeah. you're, 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 you only have your voice, so you have to use your voice to lure them. So your big competitor in a webinar is their inbox. So you have to be more interesting and more fascinating than their inbox. You'll be like, oh my god, look at the slide. Ah. And then they're like, oh, and they're getting out of the inbox because they want to see what's going on. Um, I struggle because I like to see faces. So I have this thing that I put on as a monitor, a, a monitor crown. And it's happy faces that are delighted to hear no. them speak. I do. No. I do. And then no. I, have, I do this. And then I have to drape my office because I can't, I'm such like a, like a mop that like something visual happens on my phone. And so I like I have this monitor, and they're all happy to see me. And I stand up, um, like chairmen to the board, people speaking at board meetings. You should stand up because if you're like doing your webinar like this, your chest cavity's caved in, and you're off, and then you sound like a, you know. So I stand up, I use my clicker, and I treat it as if, and then I picture. And you have um, these little faces smiling. I have 3,500 people on a webinar, no lie. And I'm like walking around. I'm like acting like whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm, I'm acting like I would, you know, using my. If you do this, if you do this, whoa, whoa, it comes out in your voice. You should. And I wanted it to. I wanted to them to feel like I was putting my all my energy in. You it. should make a Nancy Dorothy We Fit game. <laughs> <laughs> With its own special remote. <laughs> Dual purpose. <laughs> So we call these an exec executive slide summary. You can use them even when you're pitching money. They get the big idea. They're interested in that. The backup information is in the back. You can make it navigable in, in PDF or in the PowerPoint. But that, I mean, have them read the beautiful meta narrative and have all the data there that they can dump in, jump into. You're still saying do the reports. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got a report to do, and you can distribute them and read them. Just don't stand up and present them. You could maybe present the front end and say, here's our findings, da 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 da. And by the way, you know, here's a printout of the report for your enjoyment. Absolutely. I create tons of reports in PowerPoint all day long. I just don't stand up. I just don't stand up and present. Them. <laughs> if I don't need a crown for my monitor, <laughs> I don't distribute them. So. Yeah. Uh, I've been to some presentations, for example, where Google, um, what do you call them, developer advocates present, and they like to show code. Do you have a recommendation how to make it maybe more interesting? I'm sure they would want to show some code in their presentation. Yeah, wow, I can't relate to that. Yeah, so we just wrote a thing on it. I should turn it into a blog post because we just did a, um, some training on it. But that should they hand out a script to the code mm -hmm. and then now, what we keep do, the if slide it's slider? If it's projected, um, what we do is we put the whole text uh, on one slide and we do kind of the Star Wars there, scrolling credits thing. So what we do is we have, it's kind of, to the animation point, it scrolls up, it highlights what you're talking about. You see the context of the code before and after, and then it scrolls up, and then you circle what's next, and then it scrolls up, you circle what's next. It's a little more intense, <clears throat> but it works to feed it to them. Because you don't want them, they're geeks, programmers are geeks. They're, they're, you're talking about this up here, and they're already like, oh my god, they spelled this way down here. And, then, and that's your second point or third point. So you want to try to um, darken it. We also use a spotlight kind of a feature where you can um, 
darken everything and then make this one part brighter white. So there, the whole thing is there, but you're turning on a spotlight as you go through the code. I love this concept. That's another way. Just conceptually, I can't wrap my mind around seeing a Google programmer going through this trouble to make yeah. a great presentation. I mean, if, yeah. I mean, if they just want to do it, they can't. But, at, but if you're a sophisticated developers conference that shall remain nameless, that's what we do. Really? Um, I have a, another totally different question. Uh, oh, one question per person. No. <laughs> that was a good question. Uh, you buy a book. You buy a book. You can have two questions. They're both for sale. Normally you see people wander around on the stage. Sometimes you wander around a lot. Now you're sitting down. If you are from the media and, and presidents, they sometimes stand behind a podium. They don't move around a lot. Because somebody's throwing shoes at them. But Steve <laughs> and uh, Larry and others, they move around a lot. But if you're from the media, you like them to stand still so you can film them. It's very difficult to film uh, it's not my problem. A, a person moving around a lot. That's but why what do you kids. recommend? People moving around a lot or standing still? At yeah, I, um, I know the theory that if you stand behind the podium, it looks like there's a you know this defensive mechanism between you. Um, I don't like to stand behind a podium. I, I like to use this kind of thing. Uh, but a lot of times, you, know, you get to a venue. And the stage will just be those two panels. And so you know, there's a cliff, and you, you have to stand behind it. Uh, so in those cases, I stand on the side of it. I, I very seldom stand behind it. I don't stand um, behind it. Yeah. And even when it's provided, I, t I usually, what I would do in this situation, that I, we're just doing a conversation, I take my laptop off and I put it on the floor and I stand here. Because I don't want any barriers. Really good, one of our dearest, dearest friends, Gar Reynolds, wrote a book called The Naked Presenter. And he gets into that why you need, why it makes other people feel more connected to you if you're a bit more kind of exposed versus kind of half hiding. Um, and so it's a great, great, great book. What else? Good question. No, you already asked one. Yeah, I think somebody who hasn't asked yet. Um, what do you guys think about the proliferation of video case studies and genetic type, um, these sorts of things that are going on, knowing that there's been a lot of that at this conference this week? Genetic type, so what it is, is it's usually well, it's a very... Well, because I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. It's a highly, highly produced um, video with uh, lots of animated text that, um, it's beautiful, you know, it's animated text that's beautiful versus stupid, a bit PowerPoint yeah. rigs, more yeah. after effect kind of thing. I'm okay with it as long as it's not neurotic and as long as I don't get dizzy. I think it's overdone. Like if you're going to show it to a client and be like, here's a fresh new campaign and it's kinetic type, I'd be like, that was so 2008. Like well, that's we'll not cool. Recap, you know, put the presentations down, there's almost a, a request that you don't use PowerPoint until it's just one pass up and done. But then people are showing up and they'll just say, hello, here's my name, and they'll hit a button for me, and they'll play it and sit down. Huh. Wow. Wow. That's sad. That's a lot of money. Well, I think it happens more in a conference like this because sometimes people love to peacock their portfolio, right? And so they're like, oh, here's my video, and I can see that. But they're hiding behind connecting as a, as a, as a meaningful and engaging. Oh. <laughs> Not uh, engaging, enchanting. Enchanting, communicating. So I have a question for you. So I, I, have seen, I have seen people use PowerPoint or Keynote or whatever, and it's like a hundred slides, and each slide has one word. So they go... Twitter is, and then Twitter is, and then, you know, they just go down the line. It's like one second per slide, basically. What do you think of that? So a, um, there is a rapid, rapid fire. Um, no, not the, the Larry Lessig not stuff. the feature um, catch I, I think it's insulting to just like read your speech one word at a time. I think that's worse. Um, I haven't actually seen that happen yet. I do tend to. Um, I, HR department would be like, giving me the hook. Um, You're a lot. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm setting up, I'm setting up, I'm setting up, and then sometimes I'm like, I'm like, I'm like forgetting that I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move. Like, I'm trying to help them with their next move.
audience sees the slide and you see the slide and the next slide. Yeah. Right? So we get a different view than That's the audience good. gets. Do you use that? I absolutely use it every yeah. time. You know when I used it, believe it or not, and you should try to present it my firm. You're, I'm the CEO of a presentation company. The expectations for me are huge in my own firm. So my most hostile audience are my employees because they can't even get their head around my concepts if my slides aren't amazing. So I had to do these amazing slides and I wanted to stay right on script, so I use it more heavily in my own shop, believe it or not. So people are like, I can't let the words go off my slides because I need that to remember what to say. So what you can do is have beautiful concepts with butterflies and enchanting um, things, and then you can have it here and just and you have your bullets here, and the audience isn't seeing your bullets, you have it here. So that's what Obama does, technically, except he reads his, but he's looking, 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 and ping-ponging his head back and forth as he goes from teleprompter to teleprompter. So you have your teleprompter now with the new PowerPoint, which is thrilled. What about teleprompters? Teleprompters, if you're good at it, I, I, you've probably seen the Obama ones where they fast forward and his head literally goes like that, and like, when they see it, and it's no, there's no like. It's the a, Justin Bieber. Personally, look think politicians should absolutely freaking be teleprompted because they've got too much at stake with saying the wrong thing the wrong way, it turns into a firestorm. Oh my God, why am I having to deal with this communication firestorm when there's this great big thing going on in Libya, right? I mean, I think they, of all people, need to stay right on message and should do nothing head lib and everything should be scrubbed. And, um, the one, you know, some can some can do a better job than others, but I, I do think in that case it should be scrubbed. Well, and I think in crisis communication. Really I mean, you're saying they are getting thin and the higher you get, but you see these top executives, many of them, they're just reading from teleprompters. I can't. It's uh, literally really dumb in a way. Yeah. I mean, some CEOs, is, though, they can, they have rehearsed their them, speech, like I think Cisco CEO and John Chambers. He, John Chambers, he doesn't use a teleprompter. John P. James does not use a teleprompter. Tele Steve Jobs never. Steve Jobs does not use a teleprompter. They're very well rehearsed. But many do when you go to CTIA or other yeah, companies. Yeah, many executives are heavily yes. teleprompted, and they're not I mean, very it's not genuine. Human. Well, it's, high, it's high correlation between sucking and using a teleprompter. <laughs> Actually. New question. Well, related to that, how many, for a 30 minutes presentation, how many hours should you, you know, practice before to go on the road and make? It took me 30 years. No. <laughs> That's actually a really good answer. Uh, I, yeah, it, enchantment came out about a month ago, so I've been speaking about enchantment for maybe two months. So I've given the speech maybe 30 times, and I think I'm just hitting stride now. That's what happened to me. Yeah, it takes, me it takes me about 30 times. So yesterday you saw, I would say on a scale of 10, you saw probably an 8.5 for me. Um, I've done better, I've done worse. This is one you repeat all the time. Yeah, this so. is one. I know this one. All I, I don't know this one inside out yet because I'm still fudging. I'm still moving stuff around. I, I move stuff around for a long time, and uh, it takes me about 25 or 30 times of giving a speech to really have it. You know, I can give it. Yeah, I modify long. mine for every single audience. So if it's important, like I, if I'm in a room with CEOs that could be Fortune 1000. I'm going to put a ton of energy in it because my gain of ga gaining clients could be a million bucks right in the room. So I'll work really hard. I did a TEDx talk, 18 minutes. I rehearsed. It's 18 minutes. I rehearsed for 38 hours. So it all Are you kidding me? Because it can be seen by millions. It just came out. It's already been seen by like 40,000 people. That's 30 really good. Hours. And I'm getting awesome speaking engagement. I'm getting like really payoff for it. If it's raising money, if, that, if it's your staff meeting and you have 30 slides to get through, blah, 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 no, don't rehearse. If it's a staff meeting where there's a change initiative and the vision, your company's going to implode if your staff's not following the vision, put some energy into it, right? But if it's kind of a, if it's an update, don't spend that kind of energy so on it. So it's, literally, you spent 38 hours rehearsing 18 minutes? Yeah. Wow. And it's a great talk, y'all. It's on, the, it's on my new book. Wow. Right? Like, this is my first book. It better be. Book. It rocks. <laughs> So you would rather use the 38 hours than a teleprompter? Absolutely. 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 So you know what you don't get? You don't get eye contact. You want to make your communication like Velcro. You want as many hooks into them as possible. You want to like hook them emotionally. You want to hook them intellectually. You want to hook them you know, every way you can. And by removing the barriers and connecting in a really authentic way, it, it changes yeah. everything. Maybe that's why I've never been invited to speak at TED. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, are we out of time or can we take one last question? One last question. Well, just could you tell us what, the, what you did during those 38 hours? Yeah. Did you video yourself? Yeah. <laughs> no, I did. Uh, so what, we, what I did, so first thing I did was um, uh, check the uh, flow. I ran it by two people, made sure that my flow was right. And then what I did, this is content, and I use the PM. So I had all my PMs there, I rearranged them a little bit, got through that. And then what I did is I started to rehearse the thought the flow loosely. Sure, sure.
Mary's point. Trim that to 20 seconds and you'll be a minute here to make a major point. And she was in my face. She was taping me like before I got up on stage. We were doing timed videotapes. It was hard. That was hard doing. And I was like, I was like, thank you very much. Blah blah. blah. I look up and the clock starts to tick down from six five four fifty one. So I was like, right, wow. In it, but I don't come across like this. presentation lady. How many of you screw up with TEDx talk, right? Presentation girl.